Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry, your go-to source for all things John Carpenter. My name is Alex, and joining me, as always, is Noel. Hello! And we have a very special guest today. Please introduce yourself. Oh, okay. You guys change it up every single time that I'm here. Every single time. <laughs> so I, I've been sitting here waiting for you to introduce me. I was like, okay, well, now, now what? Uh, this is Kevin from uh, Made to Fail. <laughs> And previous episodes. Someone who needs no introduction. <laughs> what all do we have you on? All the Kurt Russell ones, right? Pretty much every. This is the first non-Kurt Russell one that I've done. The reason why we have you on for this one, and by the way, everyone, we're doing Ghosts of Mars. We finally reached that point. The reason we had you on this one is because there's a lot of rumors and trivia that this movie began as Escape from Mars, yet another Snake Plissken movie. You know, I was commenting to Laura while I was watching. I was like, you know what? What's your face? Commander Shepard was basically playing the Kurt Russell character. Although Ice Cube was wearing the sleeveless Kurt Russell Snake Plissken shirt. Mm -hmm. And the camo pants, they were just red. Yeah. Because it's a different planet's camo. No, there's actual side-by-side -side photos. He's wearing the exact same outfit. Even when he has the leather jacket on, it's the exact same leather jacket. <laughs> oh, man. So I have a theory about this movie. Basically, I figure that John Carpenter finally played Doom <laughs> and was like, okay... I can do that. We'll get into that more in the discussion. But the thing about this movie is I can't really find much of the actual history. There's several sites say that trivia factoid of, you know, it's adapted from Escape from Mars and early Snake Plissken script. But I can't find anything to actually back that up. Mm -hmm. Aside from Ice Cube's clothing. Well, I mean, obviously it's a reference. But I can't find any info that this was actually originally a Snake Plissken project. And it should be pointed out, back in 1996, when Escape from L.A. was wrapping up and they were starting to do the press junkets, John and Kurt did talk about how they wanted to do a third film called Escape from Earth. Mm. But their plot idea was, after Escape from L.A., all of the electricity turned off and the entire world has evolved into chaos and Snake is just trying to get off of it. And that's not really the same plot as this movie. No. I know that Escape from Earth is something that they kept trying to work on, even at the time this movie was being made and even into the mid-2000s. And they even talked about it again just a couple of years ago. They were even going to do a TV series version. The comic books that we've covered in Longbox Carpentry were meant to be a lead into Escape from Earth. That was a story they wanted to do, so I'm not sure where Escape from Mars fits into that. I don't know if this might have been an alternate idea they had for a sequel that they kind of discarded in favor of Escape from Earth. I don't know if this was meant to then be the fourth film that was going to come after Escape from Earth. I don't even know if this may be just an original project that they had done or maybe a script that they've been sitting on for a long time. I really don't know the history behind Ghosts of Mars. I haven't found any interviews with Carpenter where he talks about it. He didn't really get into it much on the DVD commentary. Trying to distance himself from it. No, well, no, the commentary was done before the film was released and he was still giddy and really enjoyed the experience. He was talking about how much fun they had. I should all say it's a commentary with him and Natasha Anstridge. They're wonderful together. Nice. So yeah, I'm not sure if this actually was a Snake Plissken project, but it's definitely a reference to it. We'll get into that. But anyways, just kind of moving into some other production notes. The film is again directed and co-written by John Carpenter and produced by his wife Sandy King as the second entry for their company Storm King Productions. The third entry, Vampires Los Muertos, would come out a year later. Like Vampires, it was again financed and distributed by Screen Gems for Sony. The co-writer on the film is Larry Sulkis, who doesn't really have many credits to his name. I don't really know much about him. Mostly, he's just made a handful of documentary shorts, including a 1988 featurette on the making of They Live. His IMDb page also said he did some uncredited direction on body bags and uncredited work on the Village of the Damned script, but I've never come across anything to actually back that up, especially Village of the Damned. I've had scripts that list all the various writers who worked on those, and he wasn't among them. And Ghost of Mars is his last credit. He's never really done anything after this. Hmm. For a while, this marked the end of John Carpenter's career as a film director. Gosh, I wonder why. This is also the last time he worked with a bunch of his recurring cast and crew. This is the last of three films with actor Robert Carradine, the last of five films with production coordinator Cheryl Miller, 
the last of seven films with actor Peter Jason and costumer Robin Michael Bush, and this is the last of 11 films with cinematographer Gary Kibbe. Hmm. Stunt coordinator Jeff Amata is the only person who will be coming back when we eventually get to the ward, so they're not done yet. And we'll get into who all worked on the score during the discussion, but it should be pointed out, this is the first time that John's son, Cody Carpenter, who is a musician in his own right, was involved as one of the synthesizer musicians during the production of the score. And we'll be hearing his name again as we go along. Mm -hmm. Oh, and as just a quick follow-up to our Escape from L.A. episode, that happened. We'll move on. We'll live. We'll resist. (sighs) Yeah. Set in a future where the Martian atmosphere has been terraformed 84% of the way to Earth conditions and the planet is inhabited by a smattering of mining towns connected by railroads, a squad of police officers heads to a local jail to pick up notorious prisoner Desolation Jones. While the convict and other prisoners are safely sealed away in the jail, every other inhabitant of the town is either missing or brutally mutilated, and it's not long before the squad finds itself under attack by feral barbarians. As related by scientist Arlene Whitlock, these are all miners possessed by the dormant warriors of Mars, eager to viciously wipe away everyone they see as invading aliens. As the cops and criminals find themselves on the same side of the conflict, a theme that John has never explored before in the past, (laughs) desolation teams with Lieutenant Melanie Ballard as they fight to escape the town, then return and blow the place sky high, all while fending off spirits that seek new hosts when their bodies are destroyed. The town goes up with Jones and Ballard, the only survivors. As he escapes to leave her answering alone to a tribunal, they are reunited with shiny chrome guns as the wave of barbarian ghosts just keeps spreading. Alex, do you recommend Ghosts of Mars? I do not. I will say I liked it more than Vampires. Mm -hmm. With the exception of the introduction of Vampires, I found it to be a less mean, although it is plenty mean, And the cast is absolutely stellar compared to the last cast. I enjoy pretty much everyone in it, but it is a garbled, inept, badly shot, badly edited, badly told tale of ghosts that aren't ghosts of Mars. Kevin, do you recommend Ghosts of Mars? Short answer, I recommend the middle 45 minutes. And that's it. (laughs) It's one of those things where I was recommending it to Lore, but not because it was a good movie. I was recommending it because it was a bad movie that she was really going to enjoy. Because, let's just put it out here right now, watching it, I didn't realize that it was a 2001 movie. I thought this was an early 90s movie, because if you look at John Carpenter, he tends to bring older styles of cinema into newer decades. And sometimes that works, and sometimes it doesn't. The real feeling I got from this was the same feeling from In the Mouth of Madness, which was an 80s movie made in the 90s, as far as the cinematography and everything. The blend of 70s aesthetics with 80s cinematography and 90s lighting and effects and everything. I thought it was early 90s, and I looked it up halfway through on IMDb, and it was like 2001. What? Yep. What? It was not a very well-made movie, but it wasn't taking itself as a not very well-made movie like Big Trouble in Little China did. It was playing it serious, and that's almost worse. I recommend the movie, not because it's a good movie. (laughs) It does suffer from all the problems that we've been running into in the last decade of John, where it's not so much that he's bringing the old style to the modern day, it's that he just hasn't figured out how to do the modern stuff. He hasn't left the 70s is the problem. He still has the old sensibilities about him, but he hasn't figured out how to adjust those to the new equipment, so it just doesn't fit. And it just leaves everything feeling kind of flat and half-assed, which isn't helped by the fact that John has kind of started half-assing things in general. It's not a very well-put-together movie, but there's a lot that I really enjoy about it. I love a lot of the production design and costume work. I think the actual script is nice. I think the characters are fun. The cast is really game. There's a lot of really cool, fun ideas in there. It reminds me a lot of one of Wes Craven's last films, My Soul to Take, where it's kind of like if you take one of those greatest hits albums, but instead of playing the original recordings, it's modern recordings of that band 40 years later playing at a bar mitzvah. (laughs) It's just not going to sound the same, but it still has all the fun greatest hits elements to it. And it's kind of neat to see how he's cherry picking all these little bits from all these past films he did and trying to find a way to smoosh them all together. It's not entirely successful, but I enjoy it. I don't know. I I enjoy the movie. It's not good. I think there's stretches where the pace is so off that even though it's a 90 minute movie, it feels like it's over two hours. 
but I still enjoy it. It's a world and characters that I enjoy exploring and would actually like to continue exploring. So I will say I recommend it. Laura was talking to me earlier this morning about Quentin Tarantino, and specifically the discussion was about Pam Greer. Mm. We were talking about Jackie Brown and how Quentin Tarantino likes to make 70s movies for modern day. But he takes it from the opposite end. Like, he takes modern day movies and makes them homages to the 70s, like love letters to the 70s, whereas John Carpenter's never really left the 70s. 70s, early 80s, yeah, definitely. This movie feels like, more than anything else, the first season of The Next Generation before they had to talk to Gene Roddenberry and said, Gene, it's not 1960 anymore. Funnily enough, guess where the production designer came from? That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, not surprising. Like I said, I was shocked to find out this was a 2001 movie because I was halfway through it, and it felt like an early 90s movie that was being made by somebody who was trying to make a 70s, early 80s movie. Like, the notes I took specifically at the beginning of this movie, aside from, if Mars is 84% terraformed, why is it still a desolate wasteland? We're only seeing the Utah region. Yeah, the aesthetics here are half Babylon 5 and half of the 1970s Battlestar Galactica. That's what it feels like, because you've got the machines that have the dials, the buttons, the old radial CRT monitors, everything that looks like it's the 1970s version of what the future is going to look like, with the 90s colors and leather and pleather, and everyone's got a badass long coat, even though they're cops. It felt really disjointed. No, I agree, and it definitely has that early 90s feel of, like, robot jocks, you know, and mm -hmm. that style of sci-fi movies, Total Recall. You know, it has that same kind of miniatures and matte painting look in an era where everything was kind of moving away from that. Up until we started talking about this, I just had it in my head that I'm like, this is 1997. <laughs> this is a movie from 1997. Everything about this. Uh, and as we were discussing before, I don't understand why they didn't just make it a Snake Plissken movie. Like they could have just had him in the prison cell like they did the guy and make it like how they dialed back the Riddick movies after the Chronicles of Riddick didn't do well. So they just went back to that pitch black formula because this seems like a precursor to pitch black and very much in the vein of doom as you were discussing as well. This came after Pitch Black. This is after Pitch Black? Yeah. 2001. I don't understand time. <laughs> this is like some altered in dimension stuff. Pitch Black 2000. It is one year after Pitch Black. This is insane. This feels like something that was made a decade before Pitch Black. Yeah. Yes. I saw this in the theater, too. Like, I saw every John Carpenter film, even when not knowing it was Super John Carpenter. I swear it was the 90s. I, I feel crazy now. <laughs> it's weird because, again, talking about Star Trek, you think, okay, the best of the newer Star Trek movies, or when I say newer, I mean the next generation Star Trek movies, was First Contact. And that felt like such a modern movie, and that was 1996. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like the complete inverse of Star Trek First Contact. <laughs> well, and then you get to Insurrection, and it looks like it was filmed during season two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, there is no excuse for a movie set in 2001 to have this bad of fight choreography. <laughs> Unless it's a sci-fi channel original movie. You know what it felt like? It felt like Gene Roddenberry's Andromeda. I could see that, yeah. It felt like Kevin Sorbo was going to walk on stage any minute now. Kevin Sorbo as Jericho would have been fun. That, that would have been cool. Yeah. Also, it was, holy fuck, Jason Statham's in this? He looks the same. <laughs> but sticking to this point, this is a problem that I had throughout the 90s where John just doesn't evolve with the times. Mm -hmm. It's not so much that his aesthetic doesn't evolve. It's just as the times are going by, he's trying less and less. And as he's losing those collaborators that he had in the 70s and 80s, he's just not finding other people who can fix his own weak areas. I mean, like Gary Kibbe, again, this is the guy who's been shooting his movies since Prince of Darkness. And it's been a steady decline since Prince of Darkness <laughs> in terms of how the movies have looked, mm -hmm. even though it's the same guy. Yeah, I'm watching it actually as we speak right now, and just some of the shots are just ridiculous. It just doesn't look good. Like, even when the virus is going from one person to the other, I'm just like, oh, this is very peculiar. <laughs> Why is it so slow? It's, there are shots <laughs> in there. The film is laid out very much the way Carpenter has laid out other movies, you know, in terms of the framing, in terms of the blocking. But it's being done by a lesser cinematographer who's not able to clean it in the way mm -hmm. that the people in the 70s and 80s were to give it that sharpness. Yeah. It's like the same eye is there, but he doesn't have the same glasses on. The composition is not bad. I feel like if this movie was made in 1987, it would have been one of his best. Yeah, like right around the Day Live era. Yeah. And again, this is shot by the same guy who shot Day Live. <laughs> this would have been hailed as a classic if it was 1987, which means it would have been Kurt Russell and Keith David. Or Adrian Barbeau and Keith David. That would have been fun. Yeah. 
And it should be noted, you guys also mentioned the lazy fight choreography, which I don't think is that bad. It's just not shot very well. This is, again, fight choreography and stunt direction by the same guy who did Big Trouble Little China and They Live, Jeff Amata, who also did the whole warehouse fight in Batman vs. Superman, who's still like one of the top stunt coordinators. Wow. It's like you wouldn't know it. It's like everyone was phoning it in this movie, and the actors, and I know you said the, the actors seemed game, but the very first half hour of the movie, my notes here said... All this dialogue is extremely forced. Mm. Pam Greer is fantastic because she's Pam Greer, but her whole, damn, it's too bad you're straight thing, that was really forced. Oh, it sure was. The first half hour of the movie was over explanation of different actions and everything. It was just, the dialogue was just so forced. It wasn't until the midway point of the movie where I was like, okay, now it's starting to pick up. See, and for me... I kind of agree with you. I don't think there's really any difference between the dialogue in this movie and the dialogue in Assault on Precinct 13. I think it's just the way that Assault on Precinct 13 was put together. It played better. There was a sharpness to it and a punch. I think, yeah, some of these actors are struggling just to kind of match that style of dialogue. Mm. And again, the way the scenes are put together, there's a very poor pace and flow to the movie. There's no real rhythm to it. Whereas, you know, Assault on Precinct 13... Everything just has this pace and this rhythm to it. And that's something Mm -hmm. that John has lost. And can I bring up the editing? Yeah. Please. Alex, what did you think of the editing? I think that's what I was trying to see your point about the action. And I think maybe the editing is exactly where the problem is, because I can see people waiting for their turn to talk. I can see people waiting for their turn to do their move in the fight. So I just don't think it's sharply edited. And maybe that's the issue. Well, and then the constant dissolves. Yeah, the The constant dissolves, even just walking down the hallway. And I understand they were trying to make it feel ethereal and otherworldly, but it felt like a drug trip. It was like, okay... They're closing the door and then dissolve cut to them having already taken two steps forward. There was no point to that. You don't feel grounded when you're watching it, for sure. And I should point out, this is the first film edited by Peter Wyshelka. He had never edited a film before. I don't know what the relationship is, but Edward A. Wyshelka was John Carpenter's editor going back to the 80s and did a whole bunch of films with John. Peter was his assistant editor for many years. I don't know if they're father and son or brothers or what, but yeah, this is a first time editor who has never edited a feature film before. I think that makes sense. It shows. And he's only made one other since. There's a lot of like music video flourishes, but like music videos from five years ago <laughs> from when this movie was made. And I kind of like the idea behind the nonlinear structure, where not only is this being relayed to us as a flashback, but then we're kind of having flashbacks within the flashbacks, or we'll see a scene play out from one point of view and then go to another point of view and branch off. But it plays those notes very clumsily. Mm -hmm. It's like it couldn't make up its mind. Where it's like, instead of coming in at the tail of a scene that we've already seen before, they're playing the entire scene out again. And it's like, we've already seen all seven lines of this dialogue. We don't need to have all seven of them again. I felt like I was playing Resident Evil through (laughs) most of this movie. And this is Jill's path. Exactly. (laughs) He's gone back to being an assistant editor, but he did this and one other movie and that's it. And I think the editing is just awful in this movie. (laughs) Not every one thing is for everyone. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and that kind of reminds me where Gary Kibbe, the cinematographer, was the assistant cameraman to Dean Cundey during that decade where Dean Cundey worked on John Carpenter's films and then suddenly rose up and became the cinematographer. And it's like, I'm wondering if this is just John was used to working with this guy. So he's like, hey, why don't you cut it this time? You know what it feels like? These people would have made it a much better movie, but they weren't given a whole lot to work with. John was like, okay, I want you to do Assault on Precinct 13 for this section. And then he walked away. And the people who were working on it was like, like, well, what the fuck does he mean by that? I guess we'll just have to figure it out. And they had like no direction after that is what it felt like. No, I don't No, It's not really the feeling I get. And from the sounds of it, everyone had a fun time making the film, and John was pretty involved on set. He did let the actors improv quite a bit, too, which he does on all of his movies. I know a lot of Ice Cube's lines were actually Ice Cube came up with them. But it is interesting, if we want to just kind of shift into that Greatest Hits thing about how, yeah, you have Assault on Precinct 13, you have Prince of Darkness, you have Escape from New York... He's even bringing in elements again from Thing from Another World. Like there's the entire scene where everyone's gathered around the door and one guy has to reach out to open it. That was the big scene in Thing from Another World. Mm. There's plot elements from Quatermass and the Pit, you know, with the ancient Martians rising up and trying to cause us to kill each other. It's interesting how this is, again, a film that is let's look back on all these other things that I've done and kind of put them in a blender, which I don't hate. I just don't think it was done as well as it could have been. I was feeling bad because part of my notes were 
it's half this and half this and a little bit of this and a little bit of this. Which isn't in itself a bad thing. Well, it, a lot of the complaint is, why not just let this stand on its own? Why do you have to keep comparing it to other stuff? But it's like, I couldn't help but make those comparisons. If the feeling is that was intentional, then that's completely understandable. It's just that while I was writing those notes, I was feeling bad for writing those notes. It's like, well, that's not being fair. I'm not knocking it in comparison to those. I actually like the way that he blends a lot of it. I like the way a lot of it's rolled together. I just don't think the actual final execution of it was very good. My problem isn't the script with this movie. My problem is just the actual making of the movie. Yeah, I could see from where both of you are coming from, actually, in this regard. It does sort of feel like a... I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm on the lower end of the spectrum for enjoyment for this film. And that's where I, I brought up my soul to take. That was one of Wes Craven's last movies where it was, here's a bit of Elm Street, a bit of Scream, a bit of Shocker, a bit of a couple other things kind of thrown together into a movie that the final film wasn't perfect and didn't entirely work, but it was still an interesting combination of elements. I think it was a worse movie than this, My Soul to Take, but I enjoyed watching it more, if that makes sense. There was a joie de vivre in that. My Soul to Take had some scenes that affected me better than this one did. Yeah. As long as we're talking comparisons, do you mind if I jump forward in time a bit? Watching this movie, I was like, okay, so that's where Joss Whedon got Reavers. Yeah. yeah, I could see that. And the escape from the police station was like, okay, so that's where Joss Whedon got the climactic battle from Serenity. Uh, <laughs> well, and if you take a look at the Super Saturday Charlotte Showcase blog that I did, Igor and I looked at a TV series called Star Hunter, which predated Firefly, yet had an incredible amount of elements that were surprisingly similar to Firefly and Serenity including an entire big reveal about a planet named Miranda and everyone dying on it. And yeah, there's a lot of questions about Serenity. Joss Whedon is uh, <laughs> a lot more like Tarantino than a lot of people give credit for. It's just that he's taking he's from nerd properties. It. Yeah, and he's taking from geekier properties that the mainstream wouldn't know as much. This is like, okay, well, this is Reavers. This is exactly Reavers. Has anybody made that mention before? <laughs> Probably not, because everyone was like, no, I didn't see this movie. <laughs> there are a bunch of space goths who are into arts and crafts. And a guar concert. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> For all the crap I've given K&B over the past episodes, I like the actual visualization of the, re of the... I almost wanted to call them Reavers, the Martians. <laughs> it looked like a Marilyn Manson video a few times to me. Especially Big Daddy Mars, yeah. Which yeah. he is, oh my god, I hated him more than the vampire. I liked him more than the vampire and vampires, but he was so silly. Like, there's the big yeah. moment where he crashes in through the ceiling and it's like, oh shit, they're up against Big Daddy Mars. And like, Ice Cube hits him twice and he falls over. Yeah. And he sounds like a Muppet. <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to sound like alien gibberish, but it sounds just like, rah, 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 rah. And that was because the teeth pieces were too big for his mouth and they decided to just not dub him over. I had a feeling. Yeah. And I should point out, he's still working. He's primarily a stuntman. He was Ben Affleck's stuntman in Batman vs. Superman. He was Paul Bettany's stuntman in Civil War. So he still does a lot of stuff. Oh, well, that's awesome. So he would have done that warehouse fight that was choreographed by the same guy who choreographed the fights in this movie. That's why Batman was saying, rah, 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 through the yeah. whole fight. And he did stunts on <laughs> Serenity. So full circle. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go ahead and bring up the star Natasha Henstridge as Lieutenant Melanie Ballard. Alex, what did you think of Natasha Henstridge? You know what? I was kind of a little harsh on her at first, and then I kind of had to readjust my views a bit because I think she did a fine job. I don't think she was stellar in the role, and I don't know if I've seen her in a role where I've considered her stellar, but I think she did a serviceable job as the straight shooting law person who also has a drug addiction. Well, then I'm guessing you weren't also a fan of She Spies like I was. She Spies? I don't even know what that is. She Spies, a few years after this, they did a kind of Charlie's Angels style syndicate show where she was the leader of the team. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad she was working and stuff because the first thing I was aware of her in was Species and she was oh, of kind course. of typecast as lady who takes her shirt off and is beautiful. So I'm glad that she got like different roles and stuff where she could show off some range. Again, after that first half hour, it got a lot better. It really picked up. So I really was having trouble connecting with her at first. And then after a while, I was like, oh, no, she's Commander Shepard. And then after that, I was like, nope, nope, perfect. She's doing fantastic. I really think that they really should have redone that first half hour. Mm. It would have been a much better movie if the first half hour was different. I think it needed to be tightened up and there needed to be more balance to the delivery of the dialogue. Yeah. I'll agree with you. While I like a lot of elements of that first half hour, I don't think it was put together very well. It didn't pick up until about the halfway point, for me, at least. Again, that's been typical of John the last few years. He doesn't have the same steam in him by this point. Mm. 
I liked her character. I thought it was kind of a nice throwback to the sheriff from the old one. I actually really love that end line they do of, you'd make a really good criminal, or you'd make a really good cop. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I like how it ended on that note. I like how she had the kind of severity, the professionalism to her, but yeah, that she's a drug addict. But then that her drugs actually end up saving her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, it's interesting. Like The cure for alien ghost parasite is recreational drugs. Yeah. And that's an interesting drug, too, where it's when you're on the dusty confines of Mars. That's a drug that makes you see water and see Earth. It feels like that's something that would be a popular drug when you're living in those conditions. I would imagine so. I can't believe it. Like, everyone should be on drugs on Mars, especially in these conditions. And then um, Ice Cube is Desolation Williams. I have no problems with Ice Cube. Natasha Henstridge had way more chemistry with him than with Jason Statham. Yes. I agree. It should be pointed out. Jason Statham was John Carpenter's choice to play Desolation Williams. Okay. Because Statham had already started making those Guy Ritchie movies in England at the time, was starting to become a bit of a name. He hadn't quite caught on in the States yet because Transporter was still a few years away. But the studios didn't think he was popular enough, so they went with Ice Cube instead. And I know mm. Jason, while he stuck with the film, kind of resented that just a little bit. So that might have affected some of his delivery. I mean, let's just go ahead and talk about Ice Cube first. He had some great chemistry. He was fantastic. I've never had a problem with Cube. I think he's not a great actor, but a very charismatic. He does this material very well. I've seen him do really good roles in like Boys in the Hood and Three Kings. But for mm. like kind of schlocky action like this, he has that kind of look in his eye. He does the action well. He does the whole badass thing very well. Triple X2. Triple X2, of course. <laughs> Cube, again, I agree with what you said. He's not a great actor, but he is a really great presence. Mm -hmm. He's one of those actors he doesn't need to be great because he just naturally has this really nice presence and charisma. Yeah, he's got that scowl and he can do the he 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 kind of like yeah. delivering the lines. Yeah, I've seen him do really good work, but yeah, he's more of a personality than a actor actor. And I think he fits a character like this. Absolutely. Where it's not so much Snake Plissken, but it is very much Napoleon Wilson. Yeah, I yeah. can see that. The Bowling Wilson in space! <laughs> spice, spice, spice. Well, let's just go on and move to Jason Statham. It's interesting, this film, John just kind of randomly decided, I'm going to make this a matriarchal society where the majority of the cast is actually going to be women. And a lot of the men are kind of in token roles. And yet he still has Jason Statham be like the horniest toxic masculinity guy around. Yeah. Here's a Jason Statham line that grabbed my interest because it seemed like interesting world building and then they never brought it up again. Throughout the entire movie, he's hitting on what's-her-face Commander Shepard. Ballard. The entire movie. And at one point, he says, there's not many breeders like us around. I don't remember that. What did that mean? Like, is everybody sterile on Mars? Or is it that everybody's women, there's not that many men? What did that mean? And they never brought it up again, and it never tied into anything. There is a lot of interesting world. And again, this is kind of like Escape from New York, where it's like the more you look into it, the less it kind of makes sense. But it's still really interesting how it's suggestive without really flat out explaining everything. It's the Wild West, where it's mining towns in an unsettled land connected by railroads on Mars. It's a matriarchal society. Men are kind of looked down on. They're bitter about it, as they would be. <laughs> <laughs> Hell, they're bitter about it when they're on top like they are now. It's interesting, uh, some of those suggestions that they make. Technically, given the radiation on Mars, everyone probably would be sterile. And then they even suggest that everyone is just there on a one-year contract that none of them knew was actually two years because it was based on Martian time. So everyone's just kind of stuck on this place that they didn't want to be on longer than they ever thought they were going to be. I'm thinking of possibilities of what a breeder could be. <laughs> So it's, it's, there's just a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense. Like, like if everybody's there specifically to terraform, why are there criminals? Well, it's like the West. You know, everyone was here to settle a new land and criminals emerged out of that. These are settlers. Anytime you put together a group of people, you're going to have criminals among them. You know, these are settlers. These are miners. These are scientists. These yeah, are but like, it's just a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense. Oh, yeah. The whole plot doesn't make sense. How do these Martians have the technology to weaponize their essences? Yeah, but that itself is they're like, ghosts. okay, okay, they're ghosts or they're bacteria or something. That's one thing. But like, you say it's 84% terraformed, but it's still a desolate wasteland. It's like, uh, they have breathable air, but no way to interchange it. There's no plants. There's nothing. That's the stuff that my mind sticks on. You've got space cordyceps, and that's fine. All you have to say is that it's space cordyceps, and people are like, okay, it's Martian, it's magic, they're ghosts, whatever, who cares? See, but those details never bothered me because 
that's stuff that John always does. And I don't <laughs> mind soft sci-fi. I don't mind sci-fi where you just suggest a lot of things. I think there's been too much of a push that if you're not doing sci-fi hard, you're doing it wrong. I don't mind that all this stuff is just kind of suggested and just dropped in and throwaway lines. That's how I like it done. Yeah, but you got to be internally consistent at the very least. I didn't find anything inconsistent. You're trying ah. to find the bridges between them. You don't have to have the bridges. Well, here's my one issue. I don't care about, I love pseudoscience more than regular science, <laughs> but I just don't understand why these warlike, they're supposed to be like a savage culture or something like that, but how do they get the technology to project themselves into that? That's just the one issue that I had a problem with, the logic of it. It could be also be just ghosts, yeah. If you look at it, it's like Prince of Darkness, spiritualism versus science. Yeah, I, but they did it better for me in Prince of Darkness, where it's just like, yeah. it's a space god and a space devil, and I'm like, cool. One, nine, nine, nine. <laughs> <laughs> See, I like the fact when they ask the doctor, okay, will a nuclear explosion kill them? And she's like, fuck if I know. Hey, it's worth a shot. It's like, okay, well, yeah, why would she know that? Like, who would know that? <laughs> I don't know if this is intentional or not, but Dan O'Bannon, who did Dark Star with John Carpenter, then did the film Return of the Living Dead, where it gets so bad where let's just nuke the town. Well, the cloud of the nuke, if this is something that spreads on winds, actually just spreads it even further, which is what <laughs> happened in the end of Return of the Living Dead. And I kind of like that idea where you can't really kill it. It's just you can't be on this planet. Mm -hmm. That was the other thing. The um, commander, I'm just going to call her Commander Shepard from now on. The Lord. She said, as far as they're concerned, we're the invaders. And I'm just sitting there going, well, they're not wrong. No, exactly. To be fair, get the fuck off. It's like American colonialism all over again. And this time they've got ghosts on their side. Just leave. Well, and about the whole body mutilation thing, one of the interesting things they got into on the commentary was he said that's not so much that the ghosts are like sadomasochists, but it's going back to a lot of reasons why tribalistic societies would do that to themselves as a fear tactic when they have enemies mm -hmm. that are either invading or that they're invading. It's about what will freak out your enemy. And in this movie, they go even further because they're in bodies that don't belong to them. They're in bodies that they don't give a shit about. Right. It doesn't matter to them that they're slicing themselves up because it's not their flesh. And as soon as that body dies, they can jump somewhere else. That makes sense. I think I just kind of got worried for a little bit, which I don't think they had this in their intention, that they were trying to show them as a primitive tribal thing because John makes Westerns. And I was a little worried that they were trying to make them like an indigenous or like a First Nations culture. So I thought that was going into racist territory, but I don't think that was the intention. He actually does get into that in the commentary where, yeah, he did do a lot of research into it's not so much what specific tribes are doing to themselves. And he's not only just talking about people in Southern and Central America, people in Asia. He's even talking mm -hmm. about Vikings, what like a lot of cultures did, getting into the psychology of why they did it. You know, why do you put your enemies' heads on pikes, which is something many European societies did? Mm -hmm. Why do you scar yourselves and paint yourselves and all that stuff? Because you're going to battle, and it's an intimidation tactic to try to psych out your enemy. And again, if you have a body that you don't really care about that you can't even feel because you're not fully a part of it, you're going to go wild with it. It becomes fun almost. I liked that he wasn't just trying to do Native American appropriation or stuff like that. And even the decor that they do where they have those almost wind chimes of like balls of nails and barbed wire and all that stuff. It's decor that's meant to intimidate people, to warn people, to scare people away. And that's what they're doing is their land is being invaded and they want to scare you away. I think maybe that's the most problem I had with the whole thing. How many pairs of scissors did that place need? <laughs> Well, maybe, you know, they have mining towns. Someone's got to make clothes for the miners. I guess so, yeah. <laughs> they raided the staples. That's right. The space staples. Mars staples. They were opening a new one. They were pushing into new territory. Mars Office Depot. And then uh, talk about the cast. Joanna Cassidy as Whitlock, the scientist. This kind of tied into John Carpenter's love of terribly shot air travel when she came in on the balloon, but uh, <laughs> she did an all right job. She wasn't... Was that weather balloon filled with hydrogen? Why did it explode? <laughs> I don't know. Why did the weather balloon explode? Because it's an early 90s action movie, that's why. <laughs> Everything must explode. I actually liked her quite a bit. Here's the other question. Where did she go after she got possessed? Because she was still on the train. No, she wasn't, because she was standing in front of the door to the nuclear facility. Oh, okay. I thought she was still on the train. You know, they never really explored what happened to her after she was possessed. Well, if she was standing in the door of the nuclear thing and exploded. I mean, that explains it. It's just, I thought she was on the train, so that was not clear to me. Well, if they ever make Ghosts of Mars 2. Okay. <laughs> 
But no, I, I expected that they would have something more carrying on after that. And, and what's weird is, you know, they have that whole thing where after Natasha Hentress goes through the thing where she takes her drugs and it purges her system of the spirit, there's a conversation between her and Desolation where if anyone else gets possessed, leave them behind. It's like, you have the drug, give them the drug. Yeah, but that's her drugs. She wants those drugs. <laughs> I mean, it would be one thing if they actually made a reference to, but I used the last one. Yeah. yeah. But no, Joanna, I liked her. I, I'm not always the hugest fan of Joanna Cassidy. I think she can overact at times, but I thought she was good here. I like how exhausted she was and how she's been fighting to get away from this so much that she's just kind of tired by this point. She was really good there. Yeah, I liked her a lot. No, and I even forgot, you know, yeah, she has a line about, oh, I escaped in a weather balloon. I forgot that then we actually see the effects of the weather balloon. Yeah. <laughs> it's very silly. Yeah. And then it explodes. <laughs> but then they do like seven dissolves in order to extend the explosion. <laughs> Yeah. Why just show the exploding and cut back to the presence? No. I don't understand. And there's even one scene where there's a wipe. Yeah. Just one wipe. That's it. And it's like, why didn't you dissolve? See, there's the lack of internal consistency there. How do you wipe inside of a dissolve inside of a flashback within a flashback within an alternate point of view of a flashback? How do you do that? You just got to remember. <laughs> you just got to wipe front to back. That's all you got to do. We had the two rookies. I don't know who the one guy was. He was Liam Waite. He's not an actor I've ever seen, but then we had Clay Duvall. Clay Duvall is an actor who I know was all over the place there in the late 90s, early 2000s. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she was. Both of them were very forgettable. I think she was more memorable just because it's Clay Duvall. Yeah. She's very distinctive. The faculty girl interrupted. She was in a ton of stuff. Yeah. She still pops up. They didn't give her enough to do, so she was kind of like in a default sulk the whole time. And then all of a sudden, she shot the guy and started the new possession. It's like, well, why? Why'd you do that? Yeah. yeah. They didn't even go into that. It's like, well, why did you do that? He just freaked her out too much that she shot him. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And then the other guy was just kind of a boring guy who was there. Yeah. But I thought he actually went out with a really... Well, yeah, then he suddenly becomes this huge action hero. With a great moment where it's like he loses his arm and he's still fighting and he's still trying to save this one guy. And just as he gets the other guy in the door, he loses his head. Yeah. One more thing here. And I know this is John Carpenter, and this is I know this is just a forget it, but you know what? This is important. Throwing buzzsaw blades by hand won't cut through bone. They're not throwing them by hand. They actually have, you even see it when Big Daddy Mars throws one. They have these kind of hook things that they're using to give it an extra. Like slingshots? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I kept seeing them like throw them like frisbees, and I was like, that's not going to cut through bone. Well, it's like Robert Carradine. They cut the throat. But then there are yeah. other ones where they have the hook that gives it the extra momentum. And I know, I know, I know. John Carpenter, the gore fest is half the fun, but that just bugged me. And it was weird how many decapitations there were. <laughs> there were a lot of decapitations, like on-screen decapitations. Clay Duvall, of course, gets the head cut off in a wonderful, wonderfully, marvelously convincing digital effect. <laughs> <laughs> Let's separate the head and scroll it like a mouse cursor. My memory was that Jason Statham got cut too, but no, he was just swarmed. Yep. And then, uh, let's see, other actors. Then there were the three, Uno, Dos, Tres. Yeah. Here were Desolation's buddies. Basically the uh, comic relief. I thought they did their job well. I don't think they particularly stood out for like, uh, I wouldn't seek them out in another role, but I think they did exactly what they needed to do. They were basic criminal gang. Yeah. It says a lot that they're there, and then 10 minutes later, they're all dead. Yeah. All three of them. Like, we need a body count. I liked Uno. I liked Dwayne Davis as Uno, the primary one, who was Desolation's brother. He had a really good presence. I even love that bit where it's like, does anyone have any questions? And he raises his hand. <laughs> <laughs> and Desolation's just like, put your damn hand down. <laughs> My notes here or genuine laugh moment, trapping them back in the cell. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, that's the point where the movie picked up for me. Mm. And then from that moment till about 10 minutes before the end, then it was like, this is an okay movie now. Well, and then we get the attempt at a genuine laugh moment with Dose and his thumb. Yeah, yeah. that was weak. I do like that he doesn't even react to cutting off his own thumb as he just holds up the can and his thumb <laughs> joint is squirt. Yeah. And then he passes out. It was funny. They telegraphed it a bit too much. Yeah. But that's an editing thing. They telegraphed it, but then you're thinking, oh, they'll never follow through on it. And then they follow through on it the way they did. Mm. <laughs> I like that. I thought, though, once they introduce that he uses a drug, every single time we see him, he's inhaling that same drug. Mm. And it's like, just, we get it, you've sold it. You know what I thought was going to happen with Uno Dos and Tres? So we see Uno get taken by a spirit. I thought he was going to come back and confront Desolation one last time. Yeah, we never do see that. 
He should have been the one on the train. Yeah, he should have been on the train and Desolation should have been fighting him. I was waiting for that to happen and it never did. I don't know why. What happened to the third? No, no, the third guy was, we saw the third guy die. Yeah, he just died. Yeah. And Thumbless guy, of course, went on the grenade. Yeah. Yeah. But no, but then even when we do have the train, okay, you blew up Big Daddy Mars, but he didn't go up in the nuke. And what happened to the one random guy that Natasha Henstridge just threw off the train well outside the range of the nuke? That's true. He's swandering around the desert. I guess it doesn't really matter anyways. He probably walked the rest of the way. See, those are the holes that bother me. Yeah. (laughs) Those are the holes where they didn't fully think it through. One other one I want to bring up just because I thought it was a character that could have used a bit more screen time. Wanda to Jesus as Akushay. The woman in the jail cell. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she got stabbed. She was fun. I liked her. It would have been neat to have Mm. her stick around. She had like three lines. If this was a 1987 movie of this, she would have had a lot more to do. Hell, have her be Desolation Jones and teamed up with Natasha Anstridge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think they underutilized Pam Greer. Oh, absolutely. 100%. Well, but I think Pam Greer was meant to be a nice psych out where you don't expect her to die as early in the film as she did. Mm. Yeah. They were doing a Janet Lee Drew Barrymore there. I'm fine with that, and I think she actually had a lot of good stuff leading up to that. My only issue with the whole her hitting on Natasha Anstridge, I like that homosexuality is present. I think that they gave a kind of a predatory angle there. Yeah, Yeah. it was a bit too gay panic, yeah. With the whole thing of, in order to get advanced, you have to sleep with your boss. It was too forced. Yeah. And the whole, like, I'm straight, like, that's not necessary. This is kind of like the Pam Greer character in Escape from L.A. I appreciate what he's trying to do. There's some elements to it that really work, and there's some elements to it that just don't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting that Pam Greer is talking about those characters. And I'm trying to think of anyone else major in the cast. Again, I mentioned this is the last film with Peter Jason, the train driver. Why was he off the train? He died because he was off the train. Why did he leave the train? He should not have left the train. He should not I'm going to be stuck on this. I'm sorry. <laughs> he ran out to help people. It was nice seeing him because Peter Jason, again, has been in almost every Carpenter movie since Prince of Darkness. He's kind of the last of the familiar faces. And then surprisingly that Robert Carradine, of all people, became a familiar face, too, because this is his third. <laughs> I have a note here. It's not going to sound like it's a positive note, but it actually is. You can't tell how bad the CGI is if you superimpose it over the main character's face. (laughs) Oh, God. Yeah, the Martians. All of her visions were superimposed over her having that drug freak out, and it actually did distract from how terrible the CGI was. That looked like an Mm -hmm. early 90s Sega CD game. Mm -hmm. It did. That was awful CG. But if you were going to have that kind of CG, hide it the way that they did. So I'm going to give them credit for doing that. God, that looked like the Atari Jaguar (laughs) Highlander, the animated series game. (laughs) That looked like the Eternal Champion Sega CD. That looked like balls. Come on. (laughs) But you can't tell how bad it is if it's superimposed over the main character's face. Yeah, that was just, oh man, that (laughs) that alone makes me surprised this was a 2001 movie. That was, yeah, man. It still felt like 1993. It did. It did. It felt like this was made alongside Escape from L.A., which itself felt like an older movie than it was. Yeah. Escape from L.A. felt like it was made in 1989. This felt like its follow-up from 1992. <laughs> God, remember the submarine. Yeah, I'm thinking of that exactly right now with <laughs> yeah. CGI goodness. Shark! But again, Star Trek First Contact was 1996, five years before this. This looks like, when did ever the first Judge Dredd came out? Because this is like very much in that vein. Oh no, Judge Dredd looked amazing. Come yeah. on. <laughs> I mean, it looks better than this for sure, but this looks like it would have been around that era of filmmaking. Yeah, and we mentioned They Live. This feels like something that would have been made a couple years after They Live. Yeah. And They Live looks better than this movie, given that it's alleyways and flannel shirts. And it would have been received better, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the score. There's this odd separation between the score in the movie and the score on the CD. Now, the score on the CD is fascinating because it's John collaborating with all these amazing guitarists. And again, it's his son, Cody, doing the synthesizer, John composing the themes. Anthrax did some tracks. And we have Steve Vai, Robin Fink, Elliot Easton, who worked for the Cars, Stone. I don't know who they are. Bruce Robb and Joe Robb, and then Buckethead. And Buckethead did a whole bunch of guitar work on the CD. The CD was fascinating to listen to. It's not that any of the themes are particularly memorable, but it's basically just one amazing guitar solo after another. (laughs) Very little of that actual CD is music that appears in the movie. And most of the music in the movie is a typical Carpenter synth score, most of which is not on the CD. 
Yeah, the only guitar stuff was during the actual fight scenes when Ice Cube was like, all right, time for plan B. I wrote down here, plan B, Doom 2016. Yeah, and that was Anthrax, and a lot of that is just them doing a very typical... There's nothing really thematic. Again, a lot of that's not on the CD, and a lot of what's on the CD is not in the movie. So it's this weird disconnect. I know the CD has a lot of fans who really enjoy the score, and they're like, Ghost of Mars had one of the best soundtracks. Yeah, but not a lot of that's in the movie. (laughs) The CD has a track with a saxophone solo (laughs) that is wonderfully 1987. You don't get that saxophone solo in the movie. At least I was trying. It's on a track called Visions of Earth. So unless I missed it under one of the drug trips. There was no saxophone in that movie. So the saxophone solo did not make it into the final cut of the movie, which makes me sad. It was a wonderful, Mm -hmm. wonderful saxophone solo wearing a wonderful mustache from the 80s and a Hawaiian shirt. Mm -hmm. It it was a saxophone solo that took life for me. So the soundtrack (laughs) was music inspired by John Carpenter's Ghost of Mars. But what's weird is on the DVD, you see him and the musicians actually putting music to the movie but a lot of that again is not in the i don't know what happened i know the whole issues with him and screen gems and sony vampires los muertos was very much coming out of the production of this movie which again he did not write or direct but he produced and and was being done by storm king productions his production company Sony and Screen Gems took it away in the end and did a lot of recutting and a lot of re-editing. I don't know if that happened here. That's not the impression I got from the commentary. From the commentary, John loved the movie and had fun making it. So I don't know what happened. This movie would have been a really good video game. It would have been a really good two levels of a video game that plays the same level ten times. (laughs) Yes. Quarry 1, Quarry 2. Quarry (laughs) 1, Quarry (laughs) 2. And I will give them points. It is an impressive big outdoor set that they built in a quarry. It looks cheap and cardboard, but it's, again, it's like an old Western set. I do love a set, yeah, but it is basically two quarries. <laughs> it's like, oh, they're blowing up that building, which is basically visible tag board. Yeah. And uh, I like the train. The yeah, train, train was cool. cool. It looks cool, but it's so weird of, we got to wait for the train to come. Oh, the train's here, but nobody's attacking it. Now we're going to have them attack the train as a diversion. Train's okay. Now train's got to come back. Well, I'm watching it right now, actually, and the extras are doing a very bad job. They're just lightly tapping their clubs and stuff <laughs> on the side of the train. <laughs> to be fair, that is a pretty armored train, so I could believe that they wouldn't get very far. It's true, but they're not giving it the old college try. Given how easy it is to get access to the decoupler. Yeah. So here's the big problem with the train. The first time they get away, they swarmed the train. The second time they got away, they only very lightly swarmed the train, but they were able to get people on the train. Why couldn't they get people on the train the first time? Because they were all, like, covering that train. Exactly. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And they were going, like, so slowly out of the station. Those are the bits of the storytelling that don't work for me. I'm fine Mm -hmm. with the weird world building. But stuff like this just feels lazy and like they didn't give a shit. You can also tell there's primary creatures swarming them and all the background people just have light makeup on. So they look like extras from cats. Yeah, yeah. Where it's like, yeah, you have all these gory face things on stuff, but then they're in the middle of the fight scene and it's people just wearing face paint. Yeah, I'm like, that guy I think has sparkles on, which is great. (laughs) And suddenly it's the warriors and they're very easy to beat. Yeah. I'm going to rescind my recommend. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Again, it's not a movie I hate. It's not a movie I hate. There's fun stuff in there. I enjoyed watching this more than Vampires. Again, the middle 45 minutes. <laughs> yeah. If you're going to go through a whole bunch of John Carpenter movies, it's one that's worth going through. Mm-hmm. Especially if you had already seen like Escape from New York and Assault on Precinct 13 and Prince of Darkness. I think it's cool to see him mash a lot of the ideas together. Yeah. And a cast having fun makes a big difference. Yeah. But just don't end your marathon through John Carpenter on this. (laughs) No. It's a good movie to bring to a horrible movie party. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, like, for us who have been spending, what, three and a half years on this podcast now, Mm -hmm. it's kind of sad to see this come to this. Now, again, I will say, it's better than Vampires. Yep. At least it's more enjoyable to watch. It's better than Village of the Damned. Mm Mm-hmm. It's... uh, I would debate about it being better than Memoirs of Invisible Man, which I thought did some things better and some things worse. I'll just go ahead and say it. I think it's better than Escape from L.A. I know not a lot of people are going to agree with me on that. I think it's at least more consistent than Escape from L.A. It's Mm. more cohesive than Escape from L.A. Yeah, it's not a rehash of the previous movie, although it's kind of a rehash at the same time. So, I mean, of the films that he made in the 90s era, which I'm going to include this in. (laughs) No, I mean, seriously, as like the tail end of it, it's close enough. And this is literally where his career ended for a while. Mm -hmm. His career ended on this movie for that last decade of his career. 
I would not say this is the worst that he made. I would put this kind of in the middle. And above it, you get the good things like In the Mouth of Madness and Body Bags, which was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. I would still put this above four other movies that he made in that era. There you go. Any other final thoughts before I get into the box office and release? Uh, let me just consult my notes. Lots of jumping explosions where people are clearly jumping off trampolines yeah. with an explosion behind them that does not really connect. Were there any Wilhelms? I didn't hear a Wilhelm. I don't recall any Wilhelms. I don't recall any. The ghosts of Mars can be stopped by doors, which is interesting. <laughs> yeah. They're very slow. Well, I mean, I mean, again, are they ghosts or are they bacteria? Because the doctor said, oh, there's bacteria on Earth. It's an alien property we don't understand because we keep comparing everything to Earth in ways. Mm. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, line chewing that I enjoy, like, here's your coffee just the way you like it. <laughs> And drop the gun to Sconzo. Yeah, drop the gun to Sconzo. <laughs> the sequence in the closet between Natasha and Jason Statham was also so incredibly forced. And this is like the least sexy sex scene <laughs> lead up. It's like, okay, you have zero chemistry together. Like not even like hatred chemistry. You have like boredom chemistry. And then it's like, okay, yeah, why not? Let's have sex. That had zero place in that movie. Yeah, no, it didn't. Even he, like, the one who was pursuing her the entire time when she starts kissing him, he looks like he's like, what are you doing? It's like, wait a minute, what? I didn't actually expect this to happen. I was just joking. Yeah. <laughs> and then they get interrupted and then never comes up again. Yep. That entire sequence, the entire point of that was to show that was the way out. The rest of it with the, hey, let's have sex, nothing. They could have just gone with, hey, there's a supply room that that's our way out. And OK, that's cool. And then that's it. And given that the entire setup throughout the film, it's about him being the guy always hitting on the woman and the woman always shooting him down. It's kind of sending the message of, yeah, but you can still eventually win them over. Yeah. There were a lot of plot threads and things that were just dropped. And dangling like so many scissors. Well, and even before I get to the box, I did just want to take a look. Just out of curiosity in terms of whether or not this was a Snake Bliskin production, I don't know. I would st That's something I'm surprised no one's really asked John about to clarify. If anyone has seen any like interview segments or something where he actually does talk about if this was a Snake Bliskin project, let me know because I would want to see that. I just wanted to look at and see what was it that Kurt Russell was up to after Escape from L.A. that would have made him too prominent to be in this movie. His film right after Escape from L.A. was Breakdown, which I remember being a big thriller at the time, doing pretty well, a nice sleeper hit. And immediately after that was Soldier, mm. which I like. It's a fun movie, but I know it didn't do very well. I like Soldier. But then the same year this came out, 3,000 Miles to Graceland, which I know a lot of people were talking about until it came out and were like, oh. <laughs> and then Vanilla Sky, where he had a small part. But yeah, then he kind of just did a few films and then his kind of big comeback where 2004 he did Miracle and then 2005 he did Sky High. Well, going back to his Disney roots. And then a couple of years later was Death Proof, which I know was a big film for him. That was his Tarantino comeback moment. And now he's been kind of steady ever since. And then what's weird is after Death Proof, he did a film called Cutlass. And then he had four years go by where he wasn't in anything. Oh, really? And then he did a film called Touchback, which I never heard of. And then another two years go by until he was in The Art of the Steel. And then another two years go by until Furious 7. Maybe he just doesn't have to. Maybe he doesn't want to. Could be. I mean, you never know. There might have been other stuff going on in his life. Maybe he had other projects that just never came together. Mm -hmm. And I know throughout the 2000s, him and John were trying to get the Escape from Earth thing going on. I'm curious as to why. Well, I, I get why he wouldn't want to do this as a Snake Plissken movie if he has this other big Escape from Earth project that he's trying to still get together. This would kind of feel like a step down from that. Mm -hmm. That or maybe he felt like he was getting a little bit too old to do it. But if he was still trying to do Escape from Earth, then I don't know. It could also be he just didn't think this was that good of a project. Yeah. Yeah. Which, I mean, he's not wrong. Yeah, for things yeah. that I enjoy about it, it's not something that Kurt Russell really needed to do. So what do you guys think the budget of this movie was? $24. $10,000. <laughs> ah, that's close. Price is right rules. Did they spend it all on the soundtrack CD that didn't get put in the movie? <laughs> Probably. Well, they had to get back out all those KFC buckets. <laughs> the film came out on August 24th, 2001, where it opened at number nine. Yeah, it deserves to. <laughs> and that is the same weekend that Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back premiered at number three. <sighs> I saw both of those in the theater. <laughs> 
Yeah. American Pie 2 was still number one in its third week. Oh, I saw that too. I had so much free time. With Rush Hour 2 at number two in its fourth week. I liked Rush Hour 2. So the week after Carpenter's Ghost of Mars is down to number 13 as Jeepers <laughs> Creepers opened at number one. Oh, God, that was the same year as Jeepers Creepers. Same year as Jeepers Creepers, which is a wow. great movie that has a very unfortunate person who made it. Yep. Wow. Okay. And then the third week, John Carpenter's Ghost of Mars is at number 27, <laughs> right below Fast and the Furious at number 24 in its 12th week. Oh, oh, my God. This came out around the same time as Fast and the Furious? The first one, yeah. I just This is just my space and time. I just can't focus. <laughs> hey, at number 14 in its seventh week is the Tim Burton Planet of the Apes, just to put wow. you in that era. Wow. wow. And number one in this week is The Musketeer, which did not stay number one for very long. No. And at number four... The debut of Rockstar. I liked Rockstar. Oh, the Mark Wahlberg film? Yeah. So two movies with Mark Wahlberg in them at the same time. Oh, wow. They keep these lists going long by this era. So in its fourth week, John Carpenter's Ghost of Mars is at number 34. <laughs> at number one, Hardball. With, uh... Was that Keanu? Keanu, yeah. Let's see. Is it still on the list in its fifth week? In its fifth week, Ghost of Mars is at number 49. <laughs> <laughs> Does the list even go that long? The list goes down to 62 at this point. Yeah, no, we're getting to the wow. era where Box Office Mojo actually kept track of stuff. Wow. Yeah, the only thing new that came out that week was Glitter, which debuted at number 11. Yeah, it did not do well. It did worse than Glitter. Even looking at other stuff that is still on the listings, even though it's been out for like 10, 11 weeks, we had Jurassic Park 3, we had Legally Blonde, we had Shrek, the first one, Ghost World. There was a lot of stuff coming out around this time. Mm -hmm. And let's see, is it on for another week? Nope, Ghosts of Mars no longer appears in its sixth week because we had at number one the debut of Don't Say a Word and at number two the debut of Zoolander. <laughs> so in total, against a $28 million budget, how much do you think Ghosts of Mars made? $28 million? I'm going to say 11 million. Three. It made $8.7 million domestic, an additional $5 million foreign, so a total worldwide gross of $14 million. <sighs> That's bad. That's real bad. Yeah, it was a tank. And yeah. it should be pointed out, John talks about how after that he retired, he wanted to leave Hollywood because he was angry about the studio system and all that stuff. This is something we've seen from John where he'll get bitter about not wanting to work with everyone when they don't want to work with him anymore. Because John mm -hmm. was in talks to do other stuff for the next decade. Like he was going to do a um, Stanford Prison Experiment movie. He was going to do a Vlad the Impaler movie. He had all these other projects that he was going to do. Him and Nicolas Cage were going to do a film together. Oh, that hurts my heart. I have the script to it. I will cover it at some point whenever I get around mm -hmm. to doing more John Acrofa. It was a film called Riot, uh -huh. where it's a prison riot movie starring Nicolas Cage, directed by John Carpenter. Oh, my God. I would have. Oh, I'll finance that right now. It was supposed to be about a teenager who committed a crime. And you know that scared straight program where it's like, let's just put a teenager in prison for a weekend just to try to scare crime out of them. Yeah. Of course, that's the the weekend of a massive prison riot and the prisoner who kind of takes him in under his wing is Nicolas Cage. Of course. That would have been beautiful. This went so far that they even had a teaser poster come out where it was Nicolas Cage, John Carpenter, riot. And the tagline was uncaged. Oh. oh my god, that would have been terrible in all the best ways. Yeah. And you can buy it on Amazon.com. The screenwriter has since adapted that script into a novel, which he has retitled Uncaged. Amazing. <laughs> Yeah, there's stories. There were other films that he was going to do. Just a couple years after this, they had the big resurgence in Snake Plissken where they were going to do an anime series. They were going to do a TV series. They started mm -hmm. a comic book line. They had a video game that was almost released before it got canceled. There was this whole attempt to resurge Snake Plissken. And I got into that on Escape from L.A. I got into it on the long box that I did with J.D. It's like John kept trying to do stuff and kept getting rebuffed. And just no one would finance his stuff anymore. I wonder why. Mm-hmm. I mean, it says a lot that Vampires is considered to be his most successful film in the 90s when it made $20.3 million against a $20 million budget. <laughs> Things just fell apart. Yeah. And I can't say I blame people for not wanting to when this is the best he's giving us. I know. I had a lot of problems with it, but we all still really liked In the Mouth of Madness. We all really liked at least half of Body Bags. Yeah. But I mean, a lot of the films he was giving us at this time were Village of the Damned. This. Yeah. Vampires. Yeah. I know Vampires as its fans were not among them. 
John just stopped giving a shit and just started half-assing stuff, and I think people rightly responded by not accepting it as much. Mm -hmm. It shows, yeah. He started to become lazy with his writing, he started to become lazy with the cinematography, lazy with the direction, lazy with the editing. Even the scores, they sound really nice when you listen to them, but they don't have anything memorable melodically in the films. They're just droning background music. Mm -hmm. To kind of get back to that earlier argument, I don't even think he was still clutching to the old aesthetic as he wasn't even putting as much work into maintaining the old aesthetic. Because mm -hmm. we have had this whole wave of product coming out recently, like Midnight Special, Stranger Things, the whole throwback to that era of filmmaking that he was a very mm -hmm. prominent figure in. They're doing something that is very retro while also still being very modern. Even when he's in the modern era, he can't even do retro properly. Mm -hmm. It just feels like he just stopped trying. Yeah. He blames the studios for not wanting to work with him and not wanting to fund his films. Yeah, but you're not giving people things that are worth funding. You're not giving people work that is worth funding. So that's been my interesting journey of going through John Carpenter in this project is kind of realizing that the reason why things started to suck wasn't because of the people he was working with. It was because of him. I hate to say that because I love John. Of course. Any thoughts you want to add, Alex? No, I, I'm kind of bummed out now. <laughs> I mean, what are your feelings kind of of the last decade, you know, from Memoirs of Invisible Man to here? Not very good movies, and it makes sense. I think he should have gone into, like, the direct-to-video market. I think he would have done better financially. I think he would have done better reined in with budgets. I think if he wasn't so burnt out on the studio system and for, like, making these big-budget films, maybe he could have made another, like, Assault on Precinct 13. Maybe he could have actually found his way into directing a Western, like, he kind of wanted but always shied away from, with, like, a smaller budget, and I think he would have done better in that regard. You know what should have happened? He should have, first off, swallowed the pride, gone to the Sci-Fi Channel, and he would have been the best goddamn director of the Sci-Fi Channel original movies, and they would have come out with some really, really, really good stuff. Yeah, I could see that for sure. Like, can you imagine John Carpenter's Ghosts of Mars, a Sci-Fi Channel original movie? I don't think it would have been any better or worse. No, but I mean, with as frustrated as he was with the studio system, he could have done a lot more with lower budget stuff and sold to basic cable and really hit a new renaissance. John Carpenter's Sharktopus versus Piranha Comet. <laughs> See, you joke, but how awesome would that have been? It probably wouldn't have been that awesome. I don't know. It probably <laughs> would have been, again, a sad step down. It probably would have been better than the ones that they actually made, but it would have been another sad step down from where we are here. But he could have built his confidence and he could have maybe rejuvenated and then it might have led to more later than instead of just completely leaving. What I think he should have done is do the same thing that like Joe Dante and John Badham and Rennie Harlan and John Landis have done going to TV. You can still do a film every couple of years, but you can still, just to keep honing your experience, just start doing TV. Because, I mean, John Badham has been one of the major directors of TV since the late 90s. Rennie Harlan did a ton of work on Burn Notice that was fantastic. Joe Dante not only has directed a ton of TVs, but created and produced a bunch of shows. You're Indiana. And you can not only just knock out episodes, one of the great things about TV directing, if you jump around a bunch of different shows, it lets you do a whole bunch of different styles and lets you do a whole bunch of different stories that you never thought you'd do, while still having the challenge of having to bring them in on a tight budget and a tight shooting schedule. That could have been something fun just to keep the wheels going. And then you can still plan other film. Like I just watched, Rennie Harlan's been directing TV for the last decade, and I just saw a film that he did, Skip Trace, with Jackie Chan and Johnny Knoxville which was a wonderful movie. And you can still put out some really fun movies while still maintaining a career that'll just keep you active and also mm. keep you in the game. Let me float something by you guys real quick. John Carpenter's Escape, a Netflix original series. I'd be into it. I don't know that I would want the John now, but if it was the John coming right off of Ghost of Mars, I would give him the budget to do a TV series. John now, I don't know if he's capable of, given his visual limitations at the moment. But we'll still get to the word. I've never seen the word. I think John is due for a comeback of some sort. I'm glad that he's had it with his music. Yeah. It's been amazing seeing him just come out of the shadows again with his music career and the touring and the music mm -hmm. videos and all that stuff. Again, it should be pointed out, he's never directed any of the music videos. He's just in them. Mm -hmm. You know what would be great? What? John Carpenter going on tour with Daft Punk. I'm not joking. No, that's I, I, I didn't even perceive that as a joke. 
What would be a fascinating thing is if like a future season of Stranger Things would have each episode directed by an actual director from that era. Yes. That'd be cool. Have John Carpenter do an episode. Have Joe Dante do an episode. That would be so fantastic. See if Spielberg would be up for it. Have Stephen King write an episode. Have Stephen King direct an episode. I like Maximum Overdrive. Stephen King needs more stuff to do. He's really awesome and I love my Uncle Stevie. (laughs) Yeah, because Stephen King doesn't do enough. Well, you know what I mean. (laughs) But I mean, John, here's the thing. I don't think this is the worst note he could have ended a career on. If Village of the Damned had been his last movie, that would have been a really sad note to end a career on. Mm -hmm. That'd been a rage quit. If Vampires had been a career ender, it wouldn't have been devastating, but it would have been sad. Ghosts of Mars, it's a bit of a letdown to end a career on, but I still think there's still more to it. There's more going on in it than we got from a lot of his last few movies. So I'm like, if this had to be his last movie, okay. Hmm. I'm glad it's not his last. I'm glad we are still going to have those Masters of Horror episodes and the ward. But yeah, I can see why for that entire decade of his career, people were just kind of like, we're not going to keep doing this. We're not going to keep enabling you, John. (laughs) And that's a weird note to say as a fan of John, who's done an entire podcast dedicated to John. I can see why a lot of the reason why things didn't work was because John stopped trying Mm. and stopped putting the effort into it that he needed to. But I can also see why he also would say that he felt burned out. Yeah. Any final thoughts to add before we end this episode? They were ghosts. They were on Mars. We learned a lot. They were ghosts of Mars. We got everything that we were promised. Yes. Yeah. This is a film that is very much exactly what you expect from the poster. And (laughs) if you saw this at a blockbuster and rented it, you would get exactly what you paid for. Again, this would be a really good movie to do for a horror movie party. And I'm going to actually think about what to pair it with for a future movie party that I do with my friends. Thank you for listening to Masters of Carpentry. Thank you for joining us again, Kevin. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Enjoy your week, everybody. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. I would go with Pitch Black or like um, Doom or something. Pitch Black would just, oh, yeah, pair this with Doom. Doom is the better movie. (laughs) That's really sad. I genuinely like Doom. If you want to say, of course, you do, go ahead. No, no, it's just really sad. (laughs) You know, thematically, you have that tie of this one had that great sequence where it was the POV, reverse POV, where they're going down the hallway just shooting everybody. Mm -hmm. Doom had the whole first person POV going down. There you go. It did. No, yeah, this and Doom. That would be a fun pairing. It would be a very boring night. (laughs) 